Jesus was in the middle of something else when the message was delivered. It was not in his plans to be interrupted and travel back to Bethany. If he did, those who had recently tried to kill him would probably try again. He was not ready to die. He had more work to do, more ways to teach and bring the world closer to God. Perhaps this was one of the reasons he did not leave right away, to avoid the threat of his own death. The message said, your friend Lazarus is dying, and yet he did not leave immediately. We do not know what he did in the two days he stayed where he was, and maybe it is not important that we know. What is important is that he does eventually make the trip to Bethany. Was it along a dusty road with twists and turns, bandits waiting to spring out and rob him and his disciples? Was it a rainy day with a bit of a chill left to the robes that clung to their wet bodies? And what was in his mind as he approached the home of his dear friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They were siblings who knew him well. They were significant in his life. What was on his mind and in his heart? He saw a figure approach him coming from the house. He knew her and was not surprised that she had left her home which was now full of people and shrouded in mourning. She was a strong person, a supportive friend through times that were good and times that were bad. Jesus watched as she approached, getting further from the house that probably still reeked of death and coming closer to him and the light that shined within him, radiated from him, light that permeated the very air around him. As she walked toward the light that was Jesus, her weary body strengthened. When Martha had left the house, she was stooped with grief. And as she and Jesus walked closer to each other, she straightened up a little bit and breathed a little more deeply touched and healed by his light as the distance between them lessened. She should not have left the house, but she did not have a choice. She felt compelled to leave, not because she did not want to be there, but because she was being called to be somewhere else. Have you ever had that feeling? She left the house filled with people who were mourning her brother's death. Instead of staying to grieve with them as a good hostess should, she, a woman, defied this Jewish custom and she left. She walked through the door and passed mourners who were speaking in hushed tones outside of the house. They looked at her, wondering what it was that would take her from familial duty. They did not see the light of Jesus Christ coming into their small world. They did not feel the heat of his magnetic energy. They just kept talking and wailing and doing what culture and custom had taught them to do. She hurried away from them and stepped onto the path. And then, and then she stopped She saw Jesus, and as they approached each other, the heaviness that she had brought with her from the house, the emotions that clung to her, mixed with the emotion of pure delight at seeing her friend. He was beloved of her brother, her sister, herself. She greets Jesus not with gratitude that he made the trip, but with a statement, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
Immediately regretting her first words to her beloved friend were accusatory, she then says, even now, I know that God will give you what you ask. Even now, even now, as I suffer in this moment of feeling the pain of loss, I forgive you for not being here to save my brother from death. I trust God. I trust you. Jesus, feeling his own sadness at the death of his friend, stood on that dusty road and considered Martha with the wisdom of his divinity and the empathy of his humanity. He knew her pain, and he had his own. He knew that as this part of his relationship with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus was unfolding, God was present. Jesus reminds Martha of this, your brother will rise again. Stating a belief of many Jews of that time, Martha says, I know, on the last day, in the resurrection. Martha is talking about an accepted tenet of that time. But this is not what Jesus is talking about. And so he takes her deeper into an understanding of spirituality and the connection that exists among himself, Lazarus, and God. He does not refute what the Jews believe. He adds to it. He invites Martha into a new understanding, and he is about to show her how it works. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. In this statement, he is claiming his divinity, I am. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the, lo- the way, the truth, and the life. This is what God told Moses to tell the people when they asked for God's name. God said, tell them, I am who I am. And what does this mean? What does it mean when God says, I am who I am? It means that God is. God is the present tense form of the verb to be, to exist, to have life. In other words, God is life. God is the place where you find what it is to truly live. We are born from God, love from love, and light from light. In our lives, until we know light and love from God, until we return to that moment, When we go back to God, love to love and light to light. Our relationships with God do not change. Rather, we change our ways of seeing and perceiving God. It is okay just to know God is. That deep and abiding presence of love Within this simplicity, we can come to realize that we do not have to have any words to describe or define God. It is not possible. Human words do not stretch far enough or deeply enough to define God. God is. Even in those places where we do see God at work, watching small children discover nature on a hike through the woods, between people who have been together their entire lives. In acts of kindness and compassion, we see God at work. Sometimes we do not feel or see God in any way. Sometimes in the places we expect to see God, we instead see nothing. Faith is what helps us continue to look and search and trust that even when we are not experiencing God, God is experiencing us. Because that's the thing of it. I am is now, God is now, always has been, is, and always will be, always. There is no other time than God. 
And on the dusty road outside of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus' house, Jesus says this very thing to Martha. He neither affirms nor denies her when she repeats the religious tenet about resurrection. He takes her to another place. I am the resurrection and the life, he says. Those who believe in me, though they die, they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Never die. Imagine what it was like to hear this from Jesus. What it felt like to be Martha in that moment. In her life, she has seen a lot of death and lost loved ones to it. And now her brother. And yet here is Jesus, trusted friend, someone she is close to, and he tells her that anyone who believes in him will not die. How do you even process this? And when and if you can and do, where do you begin to find a way to believe in someone who is standing right in front of you? How could someone not believe in flesh and bones, living matter, standing, walking, speaking, feeling. One would be wise to think that there must be more to this. And there is. Jesus asks her if she believes what he has just said. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Having in this way confessed her faith to Jesus, Martha goes to get her sister Mary, and with Jesus and the mourners, they go to the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus tells Martha to roll away the stone in front of the tomb, and she counters his request, stating that since her brother has been dead now for four days, there will be a stench. Jesus reminds Martha that she has professed her belief in him, she has stated that she knows he is the Son of God. And so he says to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now here is a place where Jesus goes a little deeper than some of the other teachings of the Gospels. The Jews have questioned Jesus' authority, asking, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept Lazarus from dying? The answer is yes, he could have. There's another answer, and it's complicated and hard to understand sometimes. The answer is also yes. But he did not, because he was doing deeper work. He was teaching on another level. He did not heal Lazarus because he had to glorify God by what he is about to do. And what he does next is even more astounding than walking on water, resisting temptation, turning water into wine, and healing those who lost their hope. Jesus brings Lazarus back to life, from very dead to very much alive. When Jesus and Mary and Martha go to the tomb where Lazarus' body has been lain, Lazarus has been dead for four days. The length of time here is significant as the belief at that time was that the spirit stayed with the body for the first three days after death and then departed. After four days, there was nothing distinguishable left. Mary, Martha, and those who were mourning and weeping were all at the tomb to witness this moment. The stone was rolled away. Jesus prayed to God, thanking God for having heard him and acknowledging that God hears prayer. And then Jesus calls Lazarus from death to life. Lazarus, come out. Lazarus comes out. Parts of him are still bound in burial cloth. Unbind him, Jesus says, and let him go. Let him go. He is freed from death. 
and freed from the human strictures of death, when he is finally free of the bonds of what held him, Lazarus can continue living. And this is how the story ends. In this ending, we can find a beginning for ourselves, a model on how to live in the constant and enduring promise of resurrection, true and deep resurrection, the promise that when we die, be it figuratively or literally, God is present. God is present, calling us to a new life, a new way of being from wherever we have been. God is here. God loves us unconditionally, always has, does, and always will. Thanks be to God. Amen.